Module 6, Lesson 15 will complete more practice with box plots. <clears throat> Imagine that you reach into a jar of Tootsie Pops. How many Tootsie Pops do you think you could hold in one hand? Do you think the number you could hold is greater than or less than what other students can hold? And is the number you could hold a typical number of Tootsie Pops? We're going to examine those questions in this lesson. As you learned earlier, the five numbers that you need to make a box plot are the minimum, the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, and the maximum. These five numbers are called the five number summary of the data. 94 people were asked to grab as many Tootsie Pops as they could hold. Here is a box plot for these data. Are you surprised? What might explain the variability in how many Tootsie Pops those 94 people were able to hold? Well, one suggestion might be that they are different ages or different size people. You would think that the bigger your hand is, the more Tootsie Pops you could grab at one time. Now let's estimate the values in the five number summary. Again, remember we need the minimum, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum. So I estimate the minimum, and remember your minimum value is at the very edge of your box plot. I estimate that to be 7. First quartile, which is the left side of the box, is 18. The median, which is the middle line inside the box, is 20. And Q3, I estimate at 22, which is the right side of the box. And finally, the maximum value which is the end of this whisker, would be 42. Next, let's describe how the box plot can help us understand the difference in the number of Tootsie Pops people could hold. And the difference is described in mathematical terms as the variability. So the, how is this box plot able to tell us the variability among the different numbers of uh, Tootsie Pops that people can hold. So as we consider the box plot, the maximum of about 42, which is the edge, the right edge of our graph, and the minimum of about 7, which again is the left side of our graph, shows you the range of 35 Tootsie Pops. So there's a difference of 35 Tootsie Pops among how many each person can uh, grab at one time. There's a difference of 35, meaning the person who grabbed the most Tootsie Pops grabbed 35 more Tootsie Pops than the person who grabbed the least. The box shows that about half of the people can hold about two more or two fewer Tootsie Pops than the median. Looking at our median, which is the center here, and then our Q1, our first quartile, which is right here at 18, and our third quarter, which is right here at 22. And this box, remember, represents 50% or half of all of the data. So half of all the people are able to grab the median, give or take two Tootsie Roll Pops.
Here's Jane's description of what she sees in the plot. See if you disagree, agree or disagree with her description. She says, one person could hold as many as 42 Tootsie Pops. The number of Tootsie Pops people could hold was really different and spread around equally from 7 to 42. About one half of the people could hold more than 20 Tootsie Pops. So it certainly is true when Jane says one person could hold as many as 42 Tootsie Pops. Um, when she says the number of Tootsie Pops people could hold was really different and spread about equally from 7 to 42, we know that the majority of the data, 50% of the data, is within two units of the median. So it's not really spread equally from 7 to 42. When she says about one half of the people could hold more than 20 Tootsie Pops, that as well is true, except that when we look at the majority of that data, we know, let's go back to our box plot, we know that 25% of this one-fourth of all of this data is between 20 and 22, not a big range above 20. So while her description may be partially true, it seems like she is kind of missing uh, the bigger picture. Here is a different plot of the same data on the number of Tootsie Pops 94 people could hold. Why do you suppose the five values are separate points and are labeled? Well, perhaps they are separate and labeled because they are far away from most of the other values. And this box plot really tells us that more than half of the data is from about 12 to 27 Tootsie Pops. Does knowing these data values change anything about your responses to exercises one to four above? Moving on, the maximum speeds of selected birds and land animals are given in the tables below. As you look at the speeds, first think about what strikes you as interesting. <clears throat> and I would say that my, the most interesting fact to me is that a peregrine falcon can fly at 242 miles per hour, and the next fastest bird is the swift bird at less than half that speed, 120 miles per hour, which still seems very fast, but to be more than twice as fast makes me wonder. Do birds or land animals seem to have the greatest variability in speeds? So when we read through, notice these are all birds on the left and all land animals on the right. The range in speed of birds is from 60 as the slowest to 242 as the fastest. 
That's quite a large range of 182 miles per hour. Whereas in land animals, we range from 9 to 75 for the cheetah. And that's a range of 66 miles per hour, um, which is a much smaller range than 182 miles per hour for, for birds. So there is a bigger variability in speeds for birds. We're going to find the five number summary for the speeds in each data set. and then determine what those five number summaries tell us about the distribution of speeds for each data set. So our five number summaries for the land animal would be a minimum of nine. First quartile is 32 and 5 tenths. The median is 43 and 97 hundredths, which would be our horse. Third quarter, Third quartile is 50, and our maximum is 75, which is the cheetah. Our summary for birds is a minimum of 60, first quartile of 76, a median of 97 and 5 tenths, and notice that's in between the frigate and the pigeon. And a uh, third quartile of 105 and a maximum of 242. Once we have the five number summary, we can then take those values and create the box plot for each of the data sets. The summaries give me a sense of the range or the span of the speeds and how the speeds are grouped around the median. And then we use those summaries to make a box plot for each of the two data sets. Please notice that these two box plots are being plotted above the same number line so that we can compare them. Which would be the next step, which is to compare and write several sentences about uh, the speeds of animals and land animals and birds. So at least one bird flies really fast, the falcon at 242 miles per hour. Three-fourths of the birds fly less than 106 miles per hour. Because remember, the end of our box plot indicates the three-fourths mark because one-fourth is from the end of our box to the end of the whisker plot. That's one-fourth of the data. Three-fourths of it, then, would be the box and then the other whisker. Three-fourths of the, of the birds fly less than 106 miles per hour. And the sl slowest bird flies at 60 miles per hour. The land animals' running speeds are slower, going from nine, to 75 miles per hour. And the middle half of the speeds for land animals is between 32 and 5 tenths and 50 miles per hour. A much a significantly smaller um, middle half of the data. And finally, we're going to look at what is the same and what is different. <clears throat> Consider the following box plots, which show the number of questions different students in three different classes got correct on a 20-question quiz. First, we'll describe the variability in the scores of the three classes. The range, which is the difference between the minimum and the maximum scores, is the same for all three classes. And so is the median, the middle score of 12. But the boxes that contain the middle half of the scores are spread very differently around the median. The third class has a very small box, so the scores are close together. 
That means most students in this class got scores that were close to each other. In class two, the minimum and the lower quartile are the same score. And the maximum and upper quartile are also the same score. There are no extremes. The middle half of the scores in class one are spread out more than in class three, but not as much as in class two. Now, if we estimate the interquartile range for each of the three sets of scores, we could say that the interquartile range for class one is approximately 10. It's ranging across 10. For class two, it ranges across 15 points. And for class three, it ranges across approximately five. And we're approximating because we can't see exactly each number since we're going by twos on our number line. And then the box is not laying exactly on top of the number line. So we are approximating because we can't see the, those exact values. And remember that the fraction that the interquartile range represents, and our interquartile range, remember, is the data within the box, that fraction is one half. It is always one half of the data. Next, the teacher asks students to draw a, dot, a box plot with a minimum value at 34 and a maximum value at 64 that had an interquartile range of 10. Jeremy said he could not draw one, uh, draw just one, because he did not know where to put the box on the number line. Do you agree with Jeremy? Well, He's given the minimum value and he's given the maximum value. So he has the beginning and the ending. The interquartile range of 10 um, tells us something about the size of the box, but it could be uh, anywhere from 34 to 44 as a starting value all the way up to 54 or 64 as an ending value with 10 in between. So Jeremy is technically correct. He doesn't really have enough information to draw that particular box plot because he doesn't know where the starting or ending value of the interquartile range is. And in viewing the box plots above, which class do you believe performed the best? and make sure that you use the data from the box plots to back up your answer. So class three, we could say performs performed the best because it has the smallest interquartile range and about half of the students scored close to the median score. Scores were more consistent with this class, meaning that there was less variability. You might also make a case that the variability is greater. Approximately 25% of the students in class one scored 18 or higher compared to 25% of the students in class three who scored 15 or higher. So you could possibly have said um, that class one in general scored higher. And then in class two, several students have scored near the top for the third quartile and the maximum to be the same. 
So it's not like there are medium scores for most of the students and then a couple of very high scores. There are quite a few students then who scored near the top for class two. In this lesson, you learned about the five number summary for a set of data, minimum, lower quartile, median, upper quartile, and maximum. You made box plots after finding the five number summary for two sets of data, and that was the speeds of birds and land animals, and you estimated the five number summary from box plots. That was when we worked with the number of Tootsie Pops people can hold and the class scores. You also found the interquartile range, which is the difference between the upper quartile and lower quartile. The interquartile range, the length of the box in the box plot, indicates how closely the middle half of the data is bunched around the median. Remember that because sometimes data values repeat and the same numerical value may fall in two sections of the plot, it is not always exactly half. This happened with the two speeds of 50 miles per hour. One went into the top quarter of the data and the other into the third quarter because the upper quartile was 50. You also practice describing a set of data using the five number summary, making sure to be as precise as possible and avoiding words like a lot and most and instead saying about one half or three-fourths.